Lecture 9. <clears throat> what more is there left to fight? <laughs> well, this lecture, we're going to cover the f Machen's fight against sentimentality. This is maybe somewhat made up, but I actually think there's something to this point, especially to consider Machen in relation to so-called evangelical Presbyterians, who turned out to be some of his mo most difficult foes during the controversy, not so much liberals as much as evangelicals. <clears throat> so what we've seen so far as a series of battles, uh, one going back to 1920 and the, um, the plan of union and the battle over that, at least as far as triggering controversies, Christianity and liberalism, its own, Machen's own expression, intervention into the struggle, defining liberalism, defining what's wrong with it theologically and in other ways. Then there's the battle over Princeton that goes between 1926, roughly 1929, the battle over rethinking missions, the battle over the in independent board for Presbyterian foreign missions, then there's the battle over the mandate, which leads to Machen's trial, et cetera. So there's a life of controversy, and it's amazing to think that he was still somewhat productive as a scholar writing his book about the virgin birth of Christ, about which I'll say more in the next lecture, God willing. Um, so w where we left off the last lecture was the General Assembly upheld the verdict of the Presbyterian New Brunswick against Machen in 1936. Uh, about maybe ten, 10 days later, you have the formation of the Orthodox Presbyterian Church. Um, and then Machen dies on January 1st, 1937. So there's not much time left for him to fight anything. But this, this fight against sentimentality, someone could argue, does take place during the final months of his life although it had preceded it as well. Um, to set this up, I think it's useful to consider something the General Assembly wrote in 1933 in relation to the controversy over rethinking missions. Um, the General Assembly wrote about itself. The GA recognizes the right of any and all individuals in the church to present criticisms of the program and work of any and all individuals or agencies which represent the church in her various enterprises. The assembly, however, deplores the dissemination of propaganda miscalculated, miscalculated to break down faith in the sincerity of such representatives. Is this an early sign of disinformation or misinformation? So, <clears throat> So there should be no dissemination of propaganda calculated to break down faith in the sincerity of representatives. They go on to write, the assembly would remind every constituent of the church that there are orderly methods of procedure whereby through the established church courts, all such representatives ought to be made. Sorry, all such representations ought to be made. In other words, if you have criticisms of someone in the church or an agency of the church, you should bring them through the established courts of the church. The assembly disapproves all methods of approach which would contravene such orderly methods, but would remind the church that both in the common law of the land and certainly in Christian charity, a man must be held innocent until he is proven guilty of any charge. And that suspicion of motives is not adequate evidence against any man and certainly ought not to be used in the Christian church. It's quite striking that in 1933, two years before the trial of Machen, they say you need evidence in the church courts to bring someone, to, to prove someone's guilt, um, which it's not exactly clear that they had evidence against Machen. Yes, they had evidence that he had violated what the church said, but there was a question about whether what the church said was constitutional. Uh, that's a fundamental principle of any kind of constitutional system. But what I'd call attention to here to are two words that the General Assembly wrote in its report on this. One is the word sincerity. People aren't, are not supposed to 
break down faith in the sincerity of other ministers in the church, and they were also not to create suspicion of motives. Was Machen actually questioning the sincerity of liberal Presbyterians? It seems to me he was saying they were wrong. He wasn't questioning their sincerity. They, have met, they have, may have been incredibly sincere in what they believed and still wrong or still out of accord with what the church taught and confessed. And was Machen questioning motives of other people? He may have done so privately, but he wasn't doing that in public. That really wasn't the issue. Again, the issue was much more in the realm of something objective, what people were doing, and whether it was opposed to what the church said was its mission and purpose. So sincerity and motives are kind of murky matters that get us into this realm of sentiment or sentimentality. Sentiment is a legitimate and valuable human emotion. Uh, I, for one, have sentiments for the Phillies. Um, they're not based on reason. Um, and I still have very fond memories of my first encounter with the green grass at Connie Mack Stadium and thinking that never did I see anything so green in my life. Uh, that's sentiment. That's, that's okay, it seems to me. What is sentimentality? Sentimentality, at least some, by some definition, is valuing something more than it is actually worth, giving something more emotional attachment than is appropriate. So being sentimental about the Phillies would be to love them as much as and in the same ways that I love my wife, or even to love the Phillies in such a way that I think they are as good as the Yankees ever were. Uh, that's sentimentality. And someone could argue, and this is what I would argue, was that the General Assembly in 1933 was guilty of sentimentality when it engaged in what it did. And I, in fact, I would argue that much of the PCUSA's logic during this period was based much more on sentiment than it was on actual thought. So Machen did have a critique of sentimentality. Um, and you see that in particular in a book that I haven't mentioned as much it doesn't receive the kind of attention that it, it should pr probably, and that is, what is faith? Book published in 1925, if you wanted a quick summary of how what is faith relates to Christianity and liberalism, Christianity and liberalism was trying to show that liberalism was unchristian or another religion altogether. What is faith? was trying to show that liberalism was anti-intellectual. Anti-intellectual, that doesn't sound the way you typically think of liberals. Henry, Harry Emerson Fosdick thought that liberals were the smart guys. They, they were the ones who were studying science, knowing what science taught, needing to adjust Christianity to what science was teaching. But here's what Machen is trying to get at in the introduction. And this gets in the, us to the realm of sentimentality. <clears throat> He's, he writes, religion, it is held, is an ineff ineffable experience. The intellectual expression of it can be symbolical merely. The most various opinions in the religious sphere are compatible with a fundamental unity of life. Theology may vary, and yet religion may remain the same because it is based on experience. Obviously, this temper of mind is hostile to precise definitions. Indeed, nothing makes a man more unpopular in the controversies of the present day than an insistence upon definition of terms. But this is the anti-intellectual anti tendency of the modern world that Machen is reacting to. So that's one part of what he means by anti-intellectual or maybe elevating sentiment or experience above its proper place. He also illustrates it in another way well, he says this is what the book is about. Over against this anti-intellectual tendency in the modern world, it is the chief purpose of this present little book. And that purpose is to defend the primacy of the intellect. And in particular, to break down the false and disastrous opposition which has been set up between knowledge and faith. 
he wants to argue that faith is based upon knowledge. And one way to illustrate that is to talk about Jesus Christ. He's, he writes in his second chapter, Faith in God. <clears throat> um, here we come to the point which we think ought to be emphasized above all others at the present day. It is impossible to have faith in a person without having knowledge of the person. Far from being contrasted with knowledge, faith is founded upon knowledge. So again, faith isn't some ineffable experience. Faith is actually based on some kind of knowledge about God's work in the world, what Christ did in the world. It's based on some kind of revelation. It's based on some kind of acts of God, not some kind of inspiration to be good. Um, so, that's where Machen was coming from. He was trying to defend the intellectual aspects of the faith, which is one of the reasons why doctrine would have been so important to him. But he came up against evangelical Presbyterians. And again, some of his biggest opponents were not liberals, but evangelicals. And it's something that a lot of people have real trouble trying to understand. And I think this is one of the reasons why Machen, people think Machen went too far when he was opposing evangelicals. It's okay to f uh, fight liberals. Liberalism is bad, of course. Even the quotation I read at the end of the last lecture from Longfield about the Machen trial. Machen was good to, to oppose secularism. But then when you have people who have some kind of regard for Jesus, that maybe they're not as, as, as good at expressing as they should be, but when that's going on, no, you shouldn't really oppose that. So Machen went too far, the argument would be. But it was those people who wound up being some of his most difficult figures and, and provided him not just with a target, but they were opponents of Machen. They, they opposed Machen also. Um, so Charles Erdman was one of these. Um, I do have a mug that says, don't be an Erdman, I guess... If Scott Clark were here, he'd ring, ring his cowbell at this point or something for the sake of Presbycast. Maybe I'm not supposed to mention a cross brand, and maybe you guys can edit it out anyway. But Erdman was born in Fayetteville, New York in 1866. He was the son of William Erdman, who was a leader in premillennialist and holiness movements of the late 19th century. Um, Erdman was also one of the lieutenants of... Um, of Moody um, during the late 19th century. So this isn't a kind of rock-ribbed Presbyterian background from which Charles, Charles Erdman comes. He went to the College of New Jersey for his undergraduate degree and then went on to study at Princeton Theological Seminary. He was ordained by the Presbytery of Philadelphia in 1891, this is Charles, and served as a pastor of Ober Overbrook Presbyterian Church in Philadelphia, western side of the city, between 1891 and 1897. Then he took a church, First Presbyterian in Germantown, from 1897 to 1906. Excuse me. And then at that point, he joined the faculty of Princeton Theological Seminary, uh, where he served as practical professor of practical theology until his retirement in 1936. So he has two pastorates, a 30-year career at Princeton Seminary teaching practical theology. He was also elected, importantly, as the moderator of the General Assembly in 1925 um, and served as pastor of First Presbyterian Church in Princeton from 1924 to 1934, which sort of ma makes Machen's time there as stated supply. 1923, kind of a fluke, or what's going on with that congregation in session? Who knows? <clears throat> Erdman finally died in 1960, and he's buried in the cemetery of Nassau Presbyterian Church in uh, New Jersey. Um, but here, here's an example, I think, a decent one, of how Erdman's sentimentality got in the way of conservatives in the Presbyterian Church and particularly became irksome to Machen. 
Um, this is, I'm going to read something from Machen's statement to the committee to investigate Princeton Seminary, the committee that was formed to try to figure out why there was a controversy going on at the church. Machen goes on for many pages about his relationship to Erdman and the misunderstandings that each, that Erdman had of him. <laughs> but one of these misunderstandings came to the issue of Machen's opposition to Erdman for the moderator position of the General Assembly in 1924. Erdman did become moderator in 1925. He was being considered in 1924. He was running against Clarence McCartney in 1924, and Machen supported McCartney over Erdman, and Erdman took offense. <clears throat> Machen explains this in this way. There was no reason why that divergence of principle should have resulted in unpleasant pleasant personalities. And I certainly did nothing to introduce such per unpleasant personalities into our relationships at Princeton. I continued to have the highest personal respect for Dr. Erdman, and there seemed to, be, seemed to me to be not the slightest reason why he should not continue in the pleasantest personal relations with his colleagues. The fact that he differed from the majority of the faculty about important matters of ecclesiastical policy did not at all prevent me from regarding him as an honored member of our body and as a valued associate. I sometimes wonder if Machen's laying it on a little thick at that point, but still, for the sake of the committee, you have to say those things in a way. <clears throat> in 1924, he goes on, Dr. Erdman was nominated for the moderatorship of the General Assembly. I was opposed to his election and voted for the other nominee, Dr. Clarence McCartney. Apparently, this action has been made the basis of an attack upon me. For in the New York Herald Tribune of June 3, 1926, in the report of President Stevenson's speech at the last assembly, it is said, Dr. Stevenson frankly accused Dr. Machen of opposing Dr. Erdman in the moderatorship election last year. It is, per that's, that's the end of the quote of the newspaper. Machen goes on, it is perhaps unnecessary to ask whether this newspaper report is at this point verbally accurate. For in any case, my opposition to Dr. Erdman's candidacy for the moderatorship, both in 1925, the year to which Dr. Erdman's, Dr. Stevenson here refers, and also in 1924, has certainly been the underlying cause even where it has not been the express ground of widespread attack upon me throughout the church. But was it a crime to oppose Dr. Erdman as a candidate for the moderatorship? If it was, then certainly I stand convicted. But to hold that it was is, I think, to destroy all liberty of conscience in the church. My opposition to Dr. Erdman's candidacy for that particular position was necessarily involved in convictions that, that are the basis of my whole life. For me to have made an opposite decision would have been to desert what I fully was convinced was my duty to the church and to God. In the first place, if I had supported Dr. Erdman in 1924, I should have been obliged to oppose Dr. McCartney, and that I certainly could not do. It is unnecessary to debate the question whether Dr. McCartney was publicly mentioned for the moderatorship before or after the mention of Dr. Erdman. My decided impression was that he was mentioned first, but I am indifferent to the question. <clears throat> what I am clear about, at any rate, is that ever since the General Assembly of 1923, Dr. McCartney was the logical, if I may so, the inevitable candidate of the conservative element in the church. So he goes on to explain why he opposed McCartney over Erdman, and yet Erdman took Machen's vote personally as a sign of disrespect to Erdman. And this is an example, I would say, of some kind of sentimentality, that there's a kind of personal relationship quality to what was going on in the church at the seminary where people would feel slighted uh, if they weren't supported. The seminary was not, to use the vernacular, a safe space for Charles Erdman. Well, who said that it was supposed to be? That's not the basis by which you conduct a faculty, the by which you conduct a theological education. It's not the basis by which you conduct the affairs of the church. 
So I would say Erdman was putting sentiment or sentimentality above principle, and Machen violated that norm, and that cost him um, a lot of a lot of um, opposition, or it, it created a lot of opposition to him in the church. Now the other opponent who is uh, doesn't people don't remember as much, but was the man who came up a number of times in the last lecture, Robert E. Speer, the secretary, general secretary of the, of the Board of Foreign Missions for the Presbyterian Church. He lived from 1867 to 1947. <clears throat> um, that would make him, I like to do this, uh, a contemporary of Erdman, and Erdman and Speer would have then been roughly 15 years older than Machen. So maybe they looked at Machen as a kind of young whippersnapper at some point along the way. Speer was born in Huntington, Pennsylvania, graduate of Phillips Academy in Massachusetts, uh, and from Princeton in uh, college in 1889, and then studied at Princeton Seminary for one year. He did not finish his degree. He was also a star athlete on the football team at the College of New Jersey or Princeton. Uh, in 1891, he was appointed secretary of the American Presbyterian Mission and began to visit in Asia and tour the world. And it was under his leadership that the Presbyterian Church became remarkably successful on the mission field. <clears throat> um, and he also was a contributor, as was Erdman, to the Fundamentals. This was the pamphlet series published in 1915 to oppose liberalism in American Protestantism. Another reason for considering him a kind of evangelical. He, he wrote a number of books. Uh, he wrote books on the Bible. He wrote books on missions. And toward in the 1930s, he wrote a book <clears throat> that Machen reviewed. And the review of this is included in uh, the Selected Shorter Writings, which I am turning to. This is a book he called Some Living Issues, published in 1929. Machen reviewed it in 1930. And again, I think what Machen writes here gets at a, a point of difficulty between him and these evangelical Presbyterians, that these evangelicals were more oriented to sentiment or sentimentality than they were to doctrine or principle. So Machen writes here, when the book is taken as a whole, our general attitude toward it is one not of agreement, but of disagreement. This disagreement is due to the fact that Dr. Robert E. Speer shows himself in this book to be, as indeed he has with increasing clearness become, a representative of that tendency in the church which seeks to mediate and obscure an issue about which we think a man must definitely take sides. So Machen would popularize a phrase called doctrinal indifferentism, and he believed that Speer was insufficiently attentive to doctrinal differences in the church. Machen goes on, that issue is the issue between Christianity as set forth in the Bible and in the great creeds of the church, and a non-doctrinal or indifferent Modernist, modernism, which is represented in the PCUSA's, in the PCUSA by the Auburn Affirmation, and that is really more or less dominant in most of the large Protestant churches in the world. With regard to that issue, three positions are possible and are actually being taken today. This is with regard to liberalism in the church. In the first place, one may stand unreservedly for the old faith and unreservedly against the indifferentist tendency in the modern church. In the second place, one may stand unreservedly for modernism and against the old faith. And in third place, one may ignore the seriousness of the issue and seek, without bringing it to an end, to preserve the undisturbed control of the present organization in the church. It is this last attitude that is represented by the book now under review. Dr. Speer certainly presents himself not as a modernist, but as an adherent of the historic Christian faith. Yet he takes no clear stand in the great issue of the day, but rather adopts an attitude of reassurance 
and palliation, according high praise and apparently far-reaching far agreement to men of very destructive views. It is this palliative or reassuring attitude which we are almost inclined to think constitutes the most serious menace to the life of the church today. It is in some ways doing more harm than clear-sighted modernism. The representatives of it are often much fur further from the faith than they themselves know, and they are leading others much further away than they have been led themselves. Obviously, such a tendency in the church des deserves very careful attention from thoughtful men. So Speer is a moderate. He doesn't see the issues. He may not even understand the faith well enough to see the issues in the church. And it's people like Speer, who is interested in preserving the order, stability, structure of the church under a generic kind of devotion to Christ, not removing in any way the supernatural character of Christianity from the church, but also not standing for it or, and also standing in opposition to those threats to it. So Spear is another example, I would argue, of a kind of sentimental attachment to the faith and putting, letting that get in the way of serious opposition to modernism as well as serious thinking about the structures of the church and what will allow people to have an honest debate about what the church should be doing about the potential problems in the church. <clears throat> so that leads then finally to perhaps what could be considered a, um, a right understanding of sentiment. And here I will turn to Machen and a sermon that he gave at the first general assembly of the, Presbyter of the Orthodox Presbyterian Church, not called the OPC then, then it was the original PCA, the Presbyterian Church of America, uh, but he preached a sermon called Constraining Love. So we're already in the realm of sentiment when he's talking about love. Excuse me. But he's, he's going to talk about love in a way that's very different from the way that, say, evangelicals like Erdman and Speer will talk about love or very different from the way that liberals may <clears throat> talk about love. This is toward the end of the, the sermon uh, at the General Assembly of 1936. This morning, we, a little branch of his church universal, are gathered for the first time together around his table. We shall go forth from this service in, to the deliberations of this assembly and then into the varied work of the church. If we remember what this service commemorates, there are certain things <clears throat> we shall be constrained by Christ's love not to do. We shall be constrained, for example, not to weaken in the stand which we have taken for the sake of Christ. How many movements have begun bravely like this one and then been deceived by Satan, have been deceived by Satan into belittling controversy, condoning sin and error, seeking favor from the world or from a worldly church, sub substituting a worldly urbanity for Christian love. May Christ's love indeed constrain us that we may not thus fall. We shall be constrained in the second place from seeking unworthy, sorry, unworthily our own advantage or preferment and from being jealous of the advantage or preferment of our brethren. May Christ's love indeed constrain us that we fall not into faults such as these. We shall be constrained in the third place from stifling discussion for the sake of peace and from, as has been said, shelving important issues in moments of silent prayer. May Christ's love constrain us from such a misuse of the sacred and blessed privilege of prayer. May Christ's love present us from doing anything to hinder our brethren from giving legitimate expression to the convictions of their minds and hearts. We shall be constrained, in short, from succumbing to the many dangers which always beset a movement such as this. Christ's love alone will save us from such dangers, but Christ's love will do more than restrain us from evil. It will lead us also into good. It will do more than prevent us from living unto ourselves. It will also lead us to live unto him. And he goes on to talk about that positive view. But it's a really curious thing, the way he appeals to love to and what 
love can do and how love actually goes with fighting, as it were. Love providing conditions for debate, for discussion, for disagreement, for making sure other people's voices are heard. Maybe he's misusing love in a way. I don't know. It seems to me to make perfect sense that you want to appeal to that love of Christ and love of your brethren in the Lord to allow those kinds of discussions to go forward, as opposed to a kind of love of organization, love of thinking you're doing good in the world, getting in the way then of those squeaky wheels who need to be silenced for the sake of what the church is doing. So it may be a bit of a stretch to think about Machen's fight against sentimentality, but it does seem to me to make sense of a lot of his work, and especially his opposition that came from evangelical Presbyterians in the church.